Only thing I'm worried about is you've got me on wrapping up and closing. <laughs> yeah, I, I know. I, I then now now I totally regret that decision. Oh, don't worry. <laughs> Wrap up thirty minutes later. I'll just do one of those cut to and play the elevator music sections. <laughs> Only if it's the um, girl from Ipanema. And that's it, everyone. This is Three Sheets Control. On behalf of Seaman, welcome aboard. On the screen in front of you, please select the level of foul mouth Disney debauchery you'd like to hear while we input your coordinates. Now, locate the monitor overhead to the right. Make sure your face is clearly visible and give us a flash. I, I mean, uh, wait for the flash. Good. Sending news to the future. All systems are go. We're now linking you to your hosts. Enjoy the show. Fuck that little spit. Now that is phenomenal. I love shaking my booty. I've never been to that. I'm sorted, but you'll be rewarded when at last I am given my dues. And I'm just this deliciously squared. <laughs> <laughs> be free, be Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 113 of Three Sheets the Mouse. We're four average guys with love for all things Disney. I'm Scott, and joining me on this week's show are three guys who were called in to take on Godzilla. Tim. Konnichiwa. Right, does it say hello in Japan? D- did you practice that all day? I did not. <laughs> I honestly did not. <laughs> Adam. I'm still recovering from Endgame. It's really long. <laughs> <laughs> what, what is it, like three and a half hours or three hours? It's three hours, three like hours and like eight minutes, oh, like and then long. you have, and you can and then, easily shave half of half an hour off of it if you at just least didn't have some lazy writing. But but it, moving on, it, and well, don't forget the previews and the end credits. Oh too. God, it's like a four well, and a half I'm hour right, ordeal. I'm just talking about the meat and potatoes. Yeah, well. uh, do they at least do that Godfather style intermission so you can go to the bathroom? Nope. See, nope. you know what? That is so inconsiderate. I mean, there's a couple of scenes you could run to the bathroom on and not really. I, there's a, a lot. there's more than a couple. Yeah, I there's get a that. lot. There's a lot of exposition, <laughs> man. I watched it and I was like, God, this is just two hours of exposition and 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 brooding. It, well, the worst was the end because the second after like the big climax scene happens and everything happens yeah, there, yeah, it doesn't. It just drags, and I'm like, it all right, does. I'm done. I need to pee, and I need to go now. And Listen, <laughs> the first five minutes of the movie is better than the last 30 minutes of the movie. Yeah, I agree. The first five minutes fucked me up. Oh, it went full Disney. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Scott, but it does. It goes full Disney in the first five minutes to the point where you're like, you, you just feel hollow. <laughs> oh, that's a nice gut punch. And oh, if you haven't awesome. guessed uh, who's on the show to derail us tonight, uh, Mikey. <laughs> no, I derailed. <laughs> Man, I'm just here so I don't get fined. <laughs> there you go. Uh, look, we're here to talk to you about some Disney parks, Disney booze, and a little bit of debauchery between. So sit back, relax, grab a sake and some sushi, and enjoy the adult side of Disney with three sheets to the mouse. I don't think you want me preparing any sushi. Well, you've got you've had <laughs> you've decent sushi down in Arkansas. I said you don't want me preparing it. He's gotta wash his hands first. Yeah, well, that's gotta true. wash my. The closest I get to sushi is literally bait. <laughs> like that's that's how close I get to making sushi. Well, making sushi. You've had sushi though. Oh yes, I've had many sushis. You like it? <laughs> I do like sushi. Do you get the raw stuff? Accidentally, this last time I went, I got the full, full raw, like the full Monty of rawness. Like normally, it's wrapped in like seaweed and rice, seaweed and stuff. No, that's I that's still not cooked. What seaweed's not cooked? No, no, I'm talking. It was wrapped in um, tuna. 
Oh, I like that. And uh, so I wasn't. I wasn't. There's probably tuna on top. Uh, I mean, it was. I think it was wrapped in tuna. Yeah, no, it was definitely wrapped in tuna. That would be super strong tuna. Yeah, taste. that'd be really. Uh, nice yep, it tuna. was. <laughs> I wouldn't mind it. I, I love. I love tuna. Anything tuna. Anything uh, salmon. Uh, I, I, I like salmon eel. if it's. Could have been eel. salmon. That in sauce that they put on that eel. Oh, that oh. eel sauce, whatever eel the sauce. Heck it is. Eel sauce that's, is that's, great. that's what they call it. Yeah, that was. We had that. Um, however, I'm down south, so dude, you give me that Cajun crawfish firecracker shit, and I'm mm. all over it. One of my favorite is the Angry Dragon. It's a uh, shrimp tempura in the middle, and then eel and eel sauce on top. It's delicious. I just don't like shrimp temp. I don't like tempura in my sushi. Uh, I had one this weekend. It was the entire thing was uh, battered in tempura and then deep fried really quick. And so it had like a nice crunchy flavor to it. It was amazing. It was awesome. Oh, was is that... crunchy a flavor or a texture? Texture. Uh, it's a flavor. Have you ever been to Long John Silver's? <laughs> crunchy is a fucking flavor. <laughs> That's true. Because you can order a box of crunchy. Well, look, if you haven't guessed tonight, uh, we're talking... We're talking the Japanese pavilion. We're going back to our ultimate Epcot, but first, Mikey, what are you drinking? Uh, I got the uh, McKenna Tenure Bottle and Bond. Oh, always tonight. a classic. Yes, it's nice. Always a classic. Adam, <laughs> what are you drinking? Because I'm, I, I'm, I'm big in Japan. I'm just having a gin and tonic. There you go. It's not. He's kind of average. <laughs> <laughs> I'm huge in Japan. Yeah. He's a giant among men in Japan. <laughs> no, I'm just normal sized. <laughs> Not gin and tonic. What, what, is that the uh, the gunpowder gin? Mm -hmm. Oh, it's so good. Yeah, I drank all the Pennsylvania gin I had last night playing video games. <laughs> so I drank all the gin. <laughs> Walking right down the middle of Main Street, USA. <laughs> with, the, with, with the rocket launcher. Who said you can't now have alcohol on Main Street? <laughs> you can also have, have giant swords down Main Street. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> And rocket launchers. If you don't believe me, Scott will show you his. <laughs> yeah. Hey, it's bigger in Japan. It is. <laughs> <laughs> um, Tim, what do you got? I've got a virgin screwdriver. A what? Orange uh -oh. juice. What the fuck? <laughs> I don't feel like drinking tonight. Oh. OJ. At least you could have made pog juice. I do have the stuff, but I was just too lazy. I'm not mad. I'm just disappointed. You know what? I like to I like to uh, drink what we're talking about, so I have some sake, warm sake. Mm. Good for you, Scott. It's really good. Good for you. Isn't sake supposed to be served? Chilled? Which one? No, it depends on the sake. Some I have uh, I have one that's chilling because I'll drink some of that later. That one is really good. It's like polished to like seventy percent. Really, really delicious. It's nice and fruity and light. Um, this is more of the uh, Jun Mai style, the Gakakan. It's pretty good. Shaka Khan, what? Shaka Khan. Shaka Khan. Shaka Khan. <laughs> I like it. You save 50% uh, like on your insurance with that. <laughs> Our uh, last trip in April, we uh, did, or, well, it was still in April. Earlier this month, we did a sake flight with James. Oh, yeah? Over at the, with the one yes. in the back of the uh, department store? No, no that was, was actually closed. Oh, Cool. It was there. It was really weird because the one in the back of the department store, because I figured they might have a different selection, had the exact same selection as the one up front. Really? That's lazy. Yes. And it was closed. So oh. <laughs> there was nobody working it. Oh, I like sake. They were too busy doing Shaka Khan. Now, did you, uh, did you have the milk sake, the, the creamy one? Yes. yes. It's not bad. We had, it's a weird taste. Yeah. You got you to gotta mix it up. No, it was... We had a very clear, mm -hmm. a somewhat cloudy, and an unfiltered. I think. I don't remember. I, I thought I had taken a picture of the names of them, but I don't have it. James probably so has it. I think it. Jen did. Jen took pictures of everything. Yes. She did. <laughs> She's yes. like your and personal videos. photographer. Because I think it was the purple bottle that we really liked, but I'm not even going to try to pronounce it or look it up. <laughs> well, it was the Shaka Khan. It was the Shaka Khan. Um, she fields for you. Yeah. <laughs> So is the Milky One basically the same thing that Tormund was raised on? The the, the giant's milk? Nah, I mean, it's a Shaka Khan milk, so she goes through the fire for you. Boy. <laughs> and on that note, I'm just going to play the intro. I'm going to play the intro music. <laughs>
Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Ultimate Epcot. All of us at Three Sheets to the Mouse are glad to have you with us as we go through land by land, pavilion by pavilion, and choose the greatest and best of all Epcot. And now, for the safety of those around you, we ask that you grab your drink, walk slowly to the person next to you, and toast them. Welcome to Ultimate Epcot. The Japan Pavilion is one of the original uh, eleven or le- original eight World Showcase pavilions. It was uh, one of the first ones actually conceived, and they had they had been planning this one since uh, around the mid to late mid to late seventies. The Emperor Emperor Hirohito is a huge huge Disney fan, or was a huge Disney fan before he died. Um, and in fact, he toured. Disneyland in 1975, which is when they were kind of planning to build Epcot, and he had he had approached Roy and said, "Roy, I would like you to do if you're going to do this, I would like you to do Japan, and I will have whatever resources you need. If you need uh, assistance, uh, if you need people to come over and uh, show you how to how to make these things, we'll gladly send people over." So that kind of created a nice relationship that Roy and uh, the Emperor actually had for for quite some years, and in fact. At that, um, at that uh, tour of Disneyland, Roy gave the Emperor a Mickey Mouse watch. You know, the, the one where his hands are the hands of the watch. Now, uh, this is a true story. So, as he wears this watch, he wears it daily. Every single day. And even on the most formal occasions, he wears this watch. So in 1979, the watch stopped ticking. And the country, I I kid you not, the country was at a standstill trying to figure out how to fix this watch. They took it down to, the palace chamberlains took it down to Tokyo, uh, where there were experts who specialized in American timepieces. I want to say this watch might have cost $20 back in the day. Uh, now, the situation was of such a national concern that Hirohito and the people of Japan actually made Time Magazine on the September 18, 1979 issue. This story made Time Magazine. Uh, long story short, the watch needed a new battery. It Don't was got no gas in it. <laughs> yeah, it was. Go. It was that. <laughs> it was that crazy. Um, but well, like, here's your problem. <laughs> <laughs> what do you say at that point? Like, oh, it just needs a battery. <laughs> what do you do? Well, you know what? Did you yeah. try turning it off and turning it back on? <laughs> Did you ship it back to the states? <laughs> Did you blow into the cartridge? <laughs> yeah, that's that's how they got us back. <laughs> yeah. That's exactly what. Yeah. Uh, now, when Walt Disney World opened, uh, two Japanese cerem- companies were in, in kind of investigating the possibilities of having a Disneyland in Japan. And so in 1974, those actually started talking. Uh, Hirohito wanted to repay Roy Disney for the um, uh, the watch. So what he did was he sent a Japanese lantern over. He had his craftsmen create one of the Toro lanterns, which are those stone lanterns that you put a candle in, and then they light the way for the tea gardens. He created one. Now, this sat at the Polynesian Resort for probably close to 10 years with no one noticing what it was or what it was there for. There's no plaque or anything. And finally, when uh, when the Japanese pavilion opened on October 1st in 1982, they had moved the, uh, the Toro, the lantern, to the Japanese pavilion. So now it sits uh, just outside of the entrance to the, uh, to the gardens. So as you walk up, you'll see a, a lantern. Uh, it's somewhat ornately carved. It's, it's very traditional. There are two... Um, deer on the side of the lantern, which represent the famous Nara Park, uh, Nara Deer Park, which is just adjacent to the uh, Emperor's Palace in in Tokyo or in Kyoto, actually. So, is it battery powered? No. <laughs> it is candle powered. Uh, but basically, thousands of people walk by this lantern every day without even realizing uh, its backstory. But now you won't have to be one of them. So, uh, look, as we get through the pavilion, it's, uh, it's had a lot of history, but it's, 
really hasn't at the same time. I mean, no, we don't have any rides. It, it's basically food and uh, sights. One of the one of the most appealing aspects of this is the architecture, the lo- the landscape of this place. It is by far one of the most stunning, one of the most beautiful pavilions to just walk through. So, Tim, Agreed. let's let's hear about those. Well, the general theme of the pavilion is entitled Japan, Land of Harmony, where tradition and innovation exists. And it starts with the big red Tory gate that you see right up close at, at the edge where the pavilion meets the lagoon. And it's probably one of the best photo opportunities in World Showcase. You get one of those photos like with, with the sunset behind Epcot in the background. When and that, get like the spaceship Earth in the middle. Yeah, and you get that like uh, that g- golden like golden glow, that purple orange glow that happens in Florida for some reason. It is spectacular. And a Tory gate is commonly found at the entrance of a Shinto shrine, and it symbolically marks the transition from mundane to the sacred. So, following that, the, the first building you see that's prominent in the pavilion is the big blue pagoda it's the replica of a 7th century I know I'm going to botch this up Hori Yuji temple Hori Yuji you were good it's close say, say it faster this is probably my favorite building in Epcot is this pagoda it's yeah. just so towering and in your face but at the same time elegant and just beautiful to look at. Yeah, it is. It is absolutely phenomenal. It really is. They did, they did a nice job recreating it, bringing it here, and and uh, pretty much doing everything that it it looks in real life. So, and one of the weirdest things about this pavilion that sets it apart from all the other pavilions is its openness has a huge courtyard area that's filled with gardens and koi ponds and a moat and a bridge and that bridge leads to a gate that goes to the White Heron Castle is what it's officially called and that is modeled after a 17th century fortress that overlooks Haimeji and that's where the art the art gallery is the other buildings you have are the ones that house the restaurants which is a uh, Tokyo Dining, Teppanetto, Katsura Grill, and there's also that little sake hut. Mm-hmm. And that's pretty much the whole pavilion. I mean, there's not really a lot there, building-wise, but there's a lot to take in. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of cool because they have the traditional uh, with, like, the um, Imperial Palace, which is the department store, combined with kind of the newer stuff, the 17th century in the White Heron Castle, and the Horyuji uh, Pagoda, which combines the old world. And it's it's really kind of that, the quintessent, uh, kind of the essence of Japan, that it, blending the tradition with the modern, which is what they did in the eight, you know 1800s when they brought in all these Western cultures to come and, and teach them how to do things and become more modernized. And now, today, I mean, Tokyo, as Ben Madden can attest, is a completely different world than the Tokyo of, you know, back when it was called Edo. I, I've always thought that the uh, the architectural styling from Japan is something that gets uh, it gets imitated, it gets mimicked, you know, here here and there. And I, I can think of a place, you know, back back home here in Arkansas that has it's, it's like an entire um, business office district kind of thing. But it has a Japanese uh, style to it because, like Tim said, it's very open. It's got a lot of um, ornamental trees and grasses and stuff growing out there. And then obviously it's got like uh, uh, not quite pagoda style, but, um, you know, it definitely has just the buildings aren't square and boxy. They just have that that flair to it that that gives it that that's and, and the thing is, it looks beautiful. But it never looks like it fits anywhere, because this just it, it just it stands out. So that's why it's nice to go to Epcot and have the whole pavilion themed that way. You don't feel like it's been shoehorned in by an architect. Uh, oh, 
as a passion project. I could go down to Jersey City, and some of my customers are big Japan uh, distributors. You know, food, Japanese food, clothing, and whatnot. And they'll take the front of a warehouse and just design the whole front of the warehouse to look like a Japanese pagoda, but then you turn around the side, and it's just a big box warehouse. Yeah, I mean, it is absolutely beautiful to walk walk through here at night, uh, walk through those gardens, and, and, and there's a lot of, like, windy paths that you can kind of walk through with uh, with Zen gardens, with rock gardens, and... Uh, the monkey puzzle trees. Yeah, the monkey puzzle trees. Those are weird-looking trees. They are. Uh, the red maples, which is probably one of my favorite trees of all time, the red Japanese got maple. one in my front yard. So do I. Planted it the day I got here. Uh, but there's, it's really cool because you walk through these bridges and it's, and you know, the bridge is like a very, uh, traditional kind of thing in Japanese design. The bridge, crossing a bridge is kind of a sim, uh, semblance of you starting a new point in your life or doing something new in your life. So it's, uh, it's nice to see that all of this architect, all of this style has been brought over, um, with the T, with the T lamps, the Toros that I talked about with the one that was, that, uh, Roy was given. Those are all dotted throughout the throughout the land and then lit up at night. It's really cool. It's a great. It really is a great place to kind of like go grab something to drink and just find your way into like the back corner and just listen to the waterfalls, listen to the the babbling brooks, and just get away from the crowds because you really can. Yeah, there's a little alcove that sometimes it's a character spot. But if it's not, it's a great place to just sit and just relax and unwind and enjoy the atmosphere of the pavilion. Yeah, it really is. Um, have you guys ever been back there, Tim and Adam? You guys have been back in the back? Yeah, we've been all over. We've been all over the Japanese pavilion. Yep. Sorry. I love the immediate assumption not to even bother asking Mikey because he can't even fucking find the people moving. Well, that's what I figured. Some, I mean, some of us in our, in, in, well, one of us in our most recent party actually tried to climb into the gardens, but we won't say anything about that. <laughs> Never, we won't say who either. <laughs> What's his name start with? I don't know. <laughs> I go in there. Uh, How do you know it was a he? Mikey. Mikey, I think you have a new shirt now. <laughs> oh. The Japanese what? Gardening Club. The J- <laughs> well, for Flower and Garden, they did topiaries for the different zodiac signs for the different years. Oh, yeah, that's cool. And somebody wanted to take their photograph with their topiary. And oh, boy. Had to get in the garden to do it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> for Flower and Garden, I love that they bring out uh, bonsai just in front of the Tory Gate. They have bonsais up all year. They have bonsais up all year. Do they, do they really? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, I see, see, they bring in these like 150 year old bonsai trees and put those, line those in front of the Tory gate. It's so cool. And you can get right up close and almost touch these trees. I mean, they are, it, they are majestic. And I've, I've killed many, many bonsai trees in my lifetime. I, yep. they're really supposed to be pretty resilient. Too. Oh, no. They're, uh, the, some of them are a bitch to maintain. They're, they're not easy. One, one year I sent my parents one for, I think it was Christmas. Mm-hmm. And they kept it around for a while. My grandma had one because we house or my grandparents um, kind of boarded a Japanese baseball player when he was doing Little League in California for summer. And when they got back home, his, his name Hideki? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> All Japanese baseball players are named Hideki. <laughs> I do. That like means Bob. And I do have like I do have a picture of me with them. I was like I was like four at the time. Um but they sent uh, when they went home. The parents sent uh, my grandparents a uh, huge, huge Chinese fir bonsai tree, and it lived for probably close to twenty years. It was a it was a damn fine tree. You know, even if they die, though, they still look real pretty right up right up until they go. Ah, uh, I love bonsai. Okay. If you haven't noticed, I have a I have a Japanese <laughs> I have a little Japanese fetish with the culture. When uh, oh, when no. my last what culture, do you not have a fetish with? Yeah, with what? any culture. <laughs> eh, there's a few that I don't. I'm trying to figure out one right now because we know it's not the London. <laughs> no, not at all. I even <laughs> think he likes the the Germanic culture when we talked about France? Uh, mm-hmm. beer garden because beer. He's a, he's a Francophile. I do you like know, he likes uh, the, he likes this the, the Scotchman and the Irishman. He's an Anglophile. I've yeah. never been to Ireland actually. I didn't say you have been there. True, but I'm sure you enjoy the the customs 
i.e. drinking. Ah, uh, yes. I love jam and, 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 and singing. Yes! Uh, you could probably drop a good, solid limerick right now. There once for a man from Kilcarno. No. You just can't finish it. No. <laughs> um, no, no I, I have always loved Japanese culture, so uh, to me, going through this pavilion is, is kind of a, a, a nice walk through somewhere that just doesn't... F well, I mean, on the hottest days, it doesn't feel like Japan, but it feels like Japan most, most times. So, it is crowded. It is crowded. It is noisy. And speaking of noise... Let's talk about some of the music, the entertainment. Well, Scott, entertainment in the Japan Pavilion, not a lot, but um, everyone knows that it has uh, some of those, um, you know, amazing taiko drummers. Mm -hmm. But before the drummers took stage, Imagineers had other ideas in mind for entertainment within the Japan Pavilion. Some of the earliest plans called for the uh, the castle entrance um, to actually be the entrance to an attraction that was going to be called the Winds of Change. Uh, that was later changed to what came to be called Meet the World. And uh, this idea got so far in progress that the actual show building was completely built and it's housed behind the uh, Mitsukoshi department store there. Um, Meet the World, uh, the, the, the attraction, um, not really, it wasn't, really, it wasn't a ride, it was, it was imagined as a four-act show similar to Carousel of Progress, but the Imagineers had the arrangement of the stages and seating area reversed from uh, Carousel. You had um, guests sit in the center of the building, and, uh, and they would be on a turntable and face outwards, and they would see the stationary uh, stages, so they would turn themselves to go from vignette to vignette to vignette um the attraction uh seating area was you know planned on being smaller than carousel of progress but uh that would allow for a larger stage presence giving them more options and flexibility for what they were going to be you know presenting um to the guests um uh, meet the world it was going to include a an actual movie screen on the back wall that you'd be facing kind of like uh, what you have at American Adventure. And you'd, you'd have both the movie playing as well as the audio animatronics on stage going at the same time. Um, at this, it, it was... Uh, it ended up actually being created, but it, it got sent to Tokyo Disneyland, where it was an opening day attraction in their Tomorrowland. Uh, it ran from 1983 to summer of 2002 before it got axed. Um, what the actual show was, it, it kind of showed a brief history of Japan in, in these four acts. You know, the, the first one opened in current day Japan with a couple kids discussing the country's past. And then a magical talking train, or I'm sorry, talking crane. Not Thomas the Tank Engine. A talking crane As in the flies bird. in. The bird. Yes, yes, the bird. Hmm. It's That's the word. Um, and it it transports them back in time, and and basically it's like a, a the crane of you know Christmas past. Mm -hmm. It takes them back in time and shows them through these different vignettes the uh, the history of of their country, um, starting as far back as far back as the uh, the volcanic beginning, going up through the early trading years, and then you know that weird period where Japan went all. Uh, Ice, you know, all solitary with with isolation, and uh, reopening its trade borders to the outside and, and the promising future. Um, the actual music that would have gone with this, or and, and did go with it in in Tokyo, was composed by the Sherman Brothers. And um, what, what I what I was able to find out as far as why it never actually came to fruition in Epcot, most of it was probably about how the uh, uh, the actual um, presentation handled the events of World War II. Yes, well, and well, it, 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 glossing over it is is an understatement. Right. Well, here's the thing: in Japan, you can, you know, you can gloss over it because they lived through it. It's, it's fine. The problem was in 1975, which is when this attraction is being developed. 1978, you have many, many, many World War II veterans still alive. 
And you do, and and their families, and their and, families, and that was Disney's concern: was how would veterans react to this era because they fought? Now I think it would be okay, and we could probably do this, but at the time it was still only thirty years post, still pretty fresh yeah. in everyone's mind. Yeah, and it it was uh, I don't know the. The, the way it was summed up is the little girl, um, when she's looking at that particular period in time, she says to the crane, it's awfully dark. And the crane says, yes, it was dark, but that's all over now. And that's how they summed up World War II. Yeah. Hmm. Really quick. Really quick. Nothing to see can, here. Yes. Move as, it along. As, <laughs> as Disney's prone to doing. Yeah. Who wants the redhead? I mean, it was over in a flash of light. <laughs> and, a, and a clap of thunder. <laughs> yeah. Um, so now, while, while this attraction actually came to fruition in Tokyo, there were other attractions considered for the uh, Japan Pavilion that never came to. And if you actually go back and listen to, is it episode one? Lapu, it Lapu is Lapu episode one. Yes, Brent, Where, our very first episode, Lapu Lapu, the Fire and the French. We decided to reimagine a ride. We did our first, our very first armchair Imagineer, and please excuse the poor audio quality. We got our, our microphones from China. Should have got them from Japan. Well, at least I did. Should have got them from Japan. <laughs> Should have got them from Japan. Seriously. Um, as long as they're not battery powered. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we, we, we discussed this, and um, one of Scott's ideas was, was kind of similar to one of the Imagineers, uh, I believe, because uh, you were looking at the bullet train, right, Scott? Yeah, we. Uh, there's been a number of uh, iterations of a bullet train attraction, and the coolest one was the bullet train through Mount Fuji. And that was one that they were uh, looking at doing, which, um, well, actually, there was first, before a bullet train, there was a, uh, a Matterhorn bobsled type ride that would have taken you through Mount Fuji. And then they decided, eh, no, we've already got Space Mountain. So they did something else, which was actually going to be filmed in circle vision, kind of. And it would have been full wraparound screens to simulate riding on a bullet train that was actually going to take you all around Japan, not just a mountain. Um, but between the two of these attractions, uh, or b between these ideas, I guess, and the uh, um, Meet the World attraction, all we got was just the, uh, the exterior show building that is a uh, storage facility. Yeah, actually, Tony Baxter, the legendary Imagineer, um, confirmed that they store paint cans there. Got to put them somewhere. The, to touch up Epcot. There's a lot of paint in Epcot, Scott. <laughs> there is a lot of paint. I mean, you can't just run down that, to that the... There's a lot of blend in blue and go away green in Epcot. Yep. You, yeah. You, you, you can't run down to your local Sherman Williams and say, hey, man, can you match this for <laughs> me? It's, no, it's off true. Epcot ball. <laughs> <laughs> off Epcot ball. <laughs> I want that no, job. you definitely can't. <laughs> so, okay, moving on to entertainment, we actually did get in the Japan Pavilion at some point. And this is, it, it's kind of a stretch to call it entertainment, but if you listened to last episode, you know I like stretching the shit out of topics. So, I, I want to introduce you to a woman named Miyuki Sugimori. Oh, also yes. Also known as Candy Miyuki. Um... She was an uh, Amizaiku artist that performed in the pavilion from uh, 96 to 2013. Um, she practiced the art of sculpting candy uh, using like a sugary rice dough. Um, it, it's a Japanese uh, tradition. It, it became popular back in the 17th and 18th century. And it's basically like being um, part... It, it's like if you were a taffy puller during the Renaissance. To what to watch them perform this? That's kind of what's going on. Basically, um, she she would take like a two hundred degree ball of rice dough and shove a, ch a chopstick into it, and then quickly because it hardens as it cools, she has to she, she would sculpt it into various animals and characters and and what have you before you know she would touch it up with a few dabs of like an edible paint. I assume an edible paint. I mean, I. I would hate to, to walk. <laughs> she no, used the paint from the store. Well, yeah, well, it's right yeah. behind just, her. Just toxic, you know, old school red number there five. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, 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 would, <laughs> I would hate to see someone walking around Epcot, some little pain in the ass kid eating one of these. 
but I mean, it, technically it's food, so it's like not wanting to eat a fancy cake, but fondant tastes like shit, so why would you? Um, yeah, she was, she was there for like 17 years. She started in 96. Yeah. And went all the way oh, to... Oh, yeah, to 2013. Yeah, that is 17 years. Yeah, 2013, yeah. Yeah, she... 17 uh, years. She was... Um, she's one of the... T- currently, she's one of the only female Amizaiku artists in the world. Um, she was an apprentice of her grandfather before going on to become formally trained. And last I read, there are only 15 formally trained sugar candy artists in the world. Amazing. Funny side note, she's, she was actually performing this weekend at the Japan Festival in Boston. Really? Oh, you should yep. get down there and mm-hmm. see her. Tell her I said hi. I've watched her videos on YouTube. Um, she, she is amazing. I mean, yeah. if you've ever seen her make, make the candy, um, I... I saw her back in like 2000 when my when one of my first trips because I wanted to spend quite a bit of time uh, in uh, in the J- Japanese pavilion. Uh, she's really amazing, and it it does it happens quick. And I would call it entertainment. She's mic'd up. She's got mm-hmm. uh, you know rope out in front of her so you can't get close and touch touch what she's doing there and what have you. So it's it's pretty pretty insane to watch her uh, because, because it does it happens quick. And then the time it would take me to draw a tic tac toe board and lay it out. All right, she's already uh, sculpted a damn pink flamingo. And and and, and you know it, it happens so fast. Like it starts out as a blob, and then she just starts yanking and twisting bits of it. And then she takes her tools out and starts crimping it to finish. And, and you're like, oh shit, that's a bird. It just looked like a pink blob. You know, two seconds ago. So yeah, check her, ch- check it out, check her out on YouTube if you haven't caught her. Super impressive. I hate that she's gone, not dead, but she's obviously because she's in Boston. Um, she's just not there anymore. <laughs> and uh, however, you can still book her and her talents for private gigs. So oh, that's pretty. She's cool. got a website. Look her up. If you're bu- if you're bougie, and you book her, let us know. We might stop by. She, she's your gal. And if and if you actually got anything from her and you have photographs or whatever, sh- share that in the group uh, in the coming weeks or whatever because I'd like to see mm-hmm. some of the other stuff that she's made because it's 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 really awesome. It's great. Artist doesn't even begin to describe what she's doing. Yeah. Now let's talk about the main attraction for entertainment purposes. Oh yeah, well, we can do that. Everyone's favorite, at least one of my favorites. Uh, the Bijutsu Con Gallery. Uh, sure. I do like the gallery. Well, then you'd love it right now because they're showing Kawaii's Japan's cute culture. It's cute. We saw. If that. you like Hello Kitty, it's up your alley. Oh, it's yeah. A lot of Pokemon. It actually wasn't as much Hello Kitty oh, really? as I thought it was going to be. It was a lot of those like ugly dolls and like those monster-looking things. Hello Kitty is from London. Okay. That's the backstory that? behind Hello Kitty. In, in Japan, actually says Hello Kitty. The backstory is that it is from London. It doesn't have a particular gender, I believe, but it's from London. Ah. And it's not actually a kitty. Nope. It's a girl. Yeah, I guess it is a girl, but not a kitty, and it's from the London. So Scott, boom, knowledge bomb dropped. There um. You go. Yeah. This. Uh. It. it <laughs> Right now, it's supposed to look like um, you're in the apartment of a super uber kawaii fan in Japan with just like everything is just over the top, uh, uh, cute and Asian. And trust me, your kids have seen this shit. Uh, But hey, you know what? It's going away in about a year because the shelf life on the uh, exhibits in the gallery are about five years. So something new is coming. Yeah, I mean, this is this is that kind of like. Tamagotchi, um, basically anything that can be like cartoonized in Japanese style. Yeah, it's food with eyeballs. Yeah, uh, Kingdom Hearts. There's some Kingdom Hearts stuff in there. Uh, it, it's it's a cool exhibit. It's it's nice. I missed the one a couple years ago. I want to say fifteen or sixteen. That's a couple. They. Well, that was four year, four years ago. And Scott Ooh. Math, that's a, that's that, that's a few, four, a few years ago. God, I wish I had a few. If I had a few dollars, I'd be drinking beer tonight instead of <laughs> dipping into my McKenna and, and running it short. It's a few. A, a few years ago, we went to the we went to the uh, the gallery, and they had like this 
culture of video games in Japan, and so it was all about like Mario and um, Sony and all the all of the kind of video game characters that have come out of Japan. And it was really cool to see like sculptures of Link and Mario and Tanuki Mario, which is a Japanese raccoon, but people think it's a ra regular raccoon. Uh, no, I knew that, but I won't get into how I knew that. <laughs> okay. I did artwork for a guy who has a podcast specifically called Talking Tanuki. Oh, okay. So there you go. Suck it, Trebek. Yeah. <laughs> Suck it long. Suck it hard. But I think what Scott really wanted me to talk about, and it wasn't... Uh, it wasn't the Kauai culture. Was it picking pearls? Yeah, let's talk about the pearl necklace. Which, by the way, back on episode one, Mikey talks all about the pearl necklace. Mm-hmm. Lots of pearl I necklace talk. I don't know why you're trying to... I don't know why you're trying to make this dirty, Scott. <laughs> because it's actually quite charming. Okay, so it is. continuing... It's fun my stretch into what is and is not entertainment. Um, I feel I'd be remiss not to mention the Pick a Pearl experience in the Mitsukoshi department store. Okay? Now, I'm not going to get in deep into the department store because someone else will talk about that. But you've got um, the chance to um, pick your own live oyster in the hopes of finding a beautiful pearl inside of it. And I know at its core, it's just, you know, a gimmick to get you to buy stuff. But the cast members typically make a really good show of it. Um, you know, when you pick your oyster, they'll ask you to bow before it as a sign of respect to the oyster that's getting ready to be sacrificed. So uh, you can get a pearl. And then each time they open an oyster, guests are encouraged <coughs> to count down in Japanese before it gets cracked. And, and this, this is pretty noisy. So uh, everybody, you know, you can, if you're in the store, you're going to hear this going on. Um, and then once it's once it's uh, once once it's taken out, the uh, the cast member will typically be you know enthusiastic and express great pleasure with the size and the color of it before she begins polishing it for you. And pro tip for an extra dollar or two, you can pay to have it put in a box. Otherwise, you'll have to wrap it up in plastic and keep it in your pocket. Now. Jesus, if you're a little more adventurous, right you can let the store staff help you wear it around your neck or get it on your finger. <laughs> um, this can take up to an hour, though, so grab a drink and relax while they do their work. Prices to get a ticket to pick a pearl run around 17 bucks an oyster, and setting it in a piece of jewelry starts at 20 bucks and goes up from there. That's it's still not a bad price for a souvenir. $35. Or thirty-seven dollars is not a bad price for a souvenir. I'm assuming you're guaranteed to get a pearl. Uh, yeah. I mean, they'll make a. You know, there's nothing written that culture. says if you open it up and empty, we keep your monies. But you know, they they people have opened up empties, and it's like, oh, pick another one. So yeah, yeah I mean, you're gonna everyone get a pearl. contains a pearl. Some are, some are very big, some are very small. Sometimes you get doubles. Well, they're cultured. Yeah, too. sometimes you get two. So. There you go. That is the main attraction in Japan. Yeah. So for forty for forty bucks, it's, that's not terrible. Second, that, that that is second only to the uh, the drummers, I guess, because that you know that that's kind of you, you kind of gloss over the drummers. Uh, they I. They I. You know, it, it's it, you know what I've. If you've got a toddler, you've heard people banging on shit before. All right. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, in all seriousness, um, the Matsuriza Taiko drummers are the main entertainment attraction. Um, if not in Japan, probably most of Epcot. Because. You can hear them pretty mm -hmm. much. Yeah, yeah, you can hear them everywhere. Um, so you've definitely probably heard them if you were in line for a Kakigori or a Saki flight <laughs> somewhere. But, uh, yeah, so um, the history of Taiko, it, that basically goes back and it kind of means drum. Um, it goes back hundreds of years. It was used in religious ceremonies at shrines, and it's changed over the course of time. Uh, the drums, you know, they're used in festivals to, you know, pray for rain. They were used by soldiers in the battlefields. And in the more ancient times, people expressed the sounds of nature, uh, wind, fire, water, and so on. They did that with uh, the Taiko drums. Um, the drum troupe at Epcot, Matsuriza, they're led by uh, Yoshihisa Shikura, 
and they've been playing their actually um, they've been playing traditional music and self composed arrangements as far back as eighty three. Wow. They, they I mean, they've, they, they, this is, and this is only their second. Um, I mean, I, I guess you'd say uh, I don't, I don't want to call them a leader, <laughs> but, but they're, they've only gone through two um, head honchos since '83. Two lead drummers. Yeah, yeah. Um, conductor. I don't know if that's even the right word because he's not out there swinging his arms. I don't know what to call the guy, but, but yeah, they've got two. Only had two, uh, two, uh, two leads since '83. And uh, you know their their sets um, are usually about fifteen minutes, and they do several of them throughout the day, showcasing the taiko drumming. Uh, it, it's they vary actually because they've got traditional and self composed uh, music, so it's it's not uh, uncommon to actually have all the performances throughout the day be different from the songs, their composition, even the quartet of men and women that perform. Um, in Japan, that they're going to vary all throughout the day. Usually, you can find them on the the balcony at the pagoda, but I've also seen like you know pictures where they've been set up um, down in the uh, the the center area, I guess, of the pavilion, in and amongst uh, the gardens and stuff like that. So it's I mean it's really cool to to see them out there. They've got um, drums ranging in size from as small as six inches tall to six feet tall. And they've even got some uh, some of their members actually will you know play like a little bamboo flute to accompany the drums. Um, now, usually the uh, the drums will start up playing you know uh, in sync as they get not you know covers of in sync. They're not playing bye bye bye. I mean like they're they're, they're synchronized. <laughs> no, I want it that way. You know what? If you want it, you're gonna ha- it's it's gonna be May before they start the in sync covers. <laughs> Uh, but, uh, you know, they, they still, um, they still tour nationally because they have so many members are able to break off and do, uh, private bookings and they're able to do talent competitions and, you know, perform at global and cultural venues. Um, so it helps having a large ensemble of talent, uh, to give them that, you know, one, one thing's for sure. Um, world showcase would be a hell of a lot quieter without them. But oh. that's not necessarily for the better because they would be sorely missed, I think. Oh, yeah. No, I would totally miss them. I love uh, standing around. And just wa- You don't even have to watch the full set. Just a couple minutes, you stand around, you watch them bang on the drum all day. Well, I just want to do that. Because they don't want to <clears> work. <throat> and they, uh, they've they also got some fancy footwork they do while they're, they're not just, they're not just uh, you know, slapping the bass, as it were. Uh, they're, they're, they got to gotta get up to get down. Yeah, no, they um, they really do pr- put on a great show. Oh yeah, it's 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 a hell of a thing to stop and watch, and they're they're they they swing with such ferocity. They're not all that uh, big people. No, some of the, there's two girls in this troupe, and they're not tall. They're not big people. I would not want to get in a fight with them if they had a mallet. No, definitely not. They have some big arms. Um, but look, as you uh, as you kind of wander through, enjoy some of the uh, entertainment that. Japan has to offer there's no better way to and I say this all the time there's no better way to an experience to experience a culture than to experience their drinking culture because that's really what the world is all about believe it or not find a way to get a drink so Adam let's talk about where you can get a little drink at uh, you can get your drink on in Japan well the garden house is the main area to get a Mm -hmm. drink and it's basically all it is really is a little hut it almost looks like if you would think about like a festival bo- festival booth inside a pavilion. Yeah, pretty much. Except with like a little inside area, but it, it's a tiny, tiny place. It can get super crowded with like five people in. Well, it. Well, I mean, it's it's this is traditionally a garden house where the gardener would live and sleep and work. That's a really it tiny is. house. They, they <laughs> would basically live, sleep, and work there, and go and tend to the gardens. But it, 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 it's on the small side. So if you go, I mean, we were in there with, I think, four or five people, and it, it, was, it got crowded quick. So it doesn't handle big groups well. No. But if you want some sake, this is the place to get it. If you've never had sake before, they usually offer some sort of sake flight. Sometimes it's there, sometimes it's not. It really depends on 
which menu they're running with. The menu here is constantly changing. And it, it was one of the hardest menus to hunt down. The Psyche Flight that I found, and I think this is the one we had, was the Junmai? Junmai. D, yeah, sure. Um, D, D, yeah. N- Nagori and D, 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 D. I did, actually. <laughs> I did. I did. I did. <laughs> <laughs> J- the didgeridoo. The dig- <laughs> Australian <laughs> sake. <laughs> it's just bad. Diagino. Australian Di- sake. Di- Dijinjo. 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 Yes, gets inside. <laughs> and <laughs> and they were all really good. That's what we actually ended up going with. But they have a pretty decent selection of sakis. They also usually have some sort of specialty cocktail. Um, some seasonal cocktails they've had was the Fuji apple, which was sake, peach schnapps, blended with Granny Smith apple syrups. They had a cucumber cooler, which was a blend of Japanese sochoku with natural cucumber syrup. They also offer some beer. Sele- There's a beer selection. They have a violet sake, which I'm not quite sure what's in it, and a Tokyo sunset, which is sort of their take on a tequila, tequila sunrise. Tequila yeah. sunrise, but it's made with Instead sake. Instead of tequila. Yes. Which is okay. weird because sake is around 15, 16%. Tequila is 40%. I mean, it's uh, different. It's different. You're not getting drunk no. off of it. I mean, it, it, it's going to take, well, when you think about sake, it's, it's basically rice mm-hmm. wine. So it takes a pretty decent amount of wine when you think about it, unless it's a very heavy wine to get you drunk. If, like maybe it's a Misty Creek Chamberson. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you drink a whole bottle of it playing video games. That'll do it. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. You drink a whole bottle of wine, you're going to get If drunk. you want, like, I love sake. I really do. And if you want to learn about sake, there was or is, I can't remember if it's still there, uh, a documentary called The Birth of Sake on Netflix. It is wonderful to watch. It's basically these people go away from their families for six months at a time and go live and work at a sake distillery and a sake uh, uh, plant. And they live, breathe, eat, sleep sake. I mean, it is, it is not just a product that they produce. It is an art form for them. It's really cool. Ugh. I just don't think we're getting the quality. Oh, no, no. This is, this is not stuff like quality here, so. stuff. This is all, I mean, Junmai, Junmai you can buy a bottle of, uh, Junmai for like five dollars at your local store, seven fifty milliliter bottle. It's not expensive at all. Uh, okay, Daijinjo, uh, Daijinjo, you're gonna spend probably something like sixteen dollars for a bottle of that. You'll spend uh, eleven dollars for a glass of that at Epcot. <laughs> I mean, but for somebody who's never had it. Mm-hmm. And if you, I would definitely try the flight. They do go over each one. They we teach were you about them too. Pretty heavily. Was this the Avengers day. Assemble? Yes, this was the original Avengers. I mean, Cheaters Assemble. Assemble. Cheaters Assemble. This was the first Cheaters Assemble because we were getting yelled at because we were all over the place. Oh, uh, okay. I got I got kind of excited when you said um, Violet Saki. I thought maybe it was a Saki made from violets, but I just looked it up and it's just purple. It's a it's a purple yeah, cocktail. It's just a purple drink. It's a sake based it, It's purple cocktail. drink. Yeah, it, well, they say it tastes <laughs> like a Jolly Rancher. I don't like sweet drinks. No, so it, yeah, it I looks. It. I mean, can I can I use the word hella? Because it looks hella sweet in this. It looks like grape fucking Kool Aid, with with a lemon but on I top do of have, it. I do have a tendency to get a plum wine martini anytime I go for sushi, which is usually the plum wine with um, gin, and then they put a. Uh, Sour plum in the bottom of the glass. It, that's, that's pretty good. This is a very Instagram worthy drink. This violet sock. It's very purple. Well, you do the shot. I mean, I love doing the. Uh, I really enjoyed doing the tastings, and it was t- one of Tim's first time trying sake. No, it was my first time drink, trying sake. You and did, it was you right did. when we first met up with James and Jen and Tony and Julia. And James is a big sake fan. Yeah, he and was. Did, they didn't have to put watermelon in I was going to say, um, that was my first time <laughs> having sake was with James, and the cup of sake we had uh, had foil on top of it. It was like single serve, peel the foil back and drink it out of the cup kind of thing. Oh, like a like the water you get on your tray at the prison. 
Yeah, but it had <laughs> better looking graffiti, that. I think, on the cup. <laughs> I enjoyed it, so I'm like thinking, I want to try this flight because... It's a good flight. It really is. What, the, is, what does it go for? What's it go for? Uh, about thirteen twenty-five. That's fair. That's thirteen twenty. Yeah, but that's six right. ounces of alcohol. Yeah, I mean that's like, and it's not. But it's not very no, strong it's, alcohol. No, it's six. It's six ounces of wine for thirteen bucks, which is what you will pay for a six ounce glass of wine pretty much everywhere else on property. What it is is it's thirteen bucks for an adventure in Japan. It is. It is. Uh, speaking of sake, uh, well, let's go over a couple of other things that are still at the the garden house. Um, they have they have beer here. Now, Japanese beer is different. It's very light. It is okay. not hoppy whatsoever. The Japanese don't have a big flavor palette. So Sapporo, Kirin, Asahi, they're all very dry, very light, very lagery style beers because that's what they that's what they enjoy. Uh, I've told this story on BSA. I've told it on three sheets. When the when the Japanese brought scotch to Japan and created their own brand of it and created their own style of it, they took out a lot of the smoke flavors. It's, it's very mellow, very fruity, very smooth. That's the same way with beer. They don't use a lot of hops. It's very much like Bud Light. Watery and light and... Uh, I mean... A little bit of flavor, but not overly flavored. It's it's really bland. Um, you're, you're talking to a guy who drinks a lot of hams, all right? Well, then you'll like it. I won't, because I don't really like hams, but I can't beat <laughs> the price. <laughs> I will say, Sapporo is actually good. Asahi's not bad. Uh, Kirin, I'm not a big fan of. And, and then the Kirin Frozen Draft is uber weird because Why, yeah no bad bad idea don't freeze people beer really li- people like it but for people who who were drinking it really enjoyed it but it just no. so it's a draft beer and then they put this like this magic foam on top that is well, it's, frozen. it's frozen foam and it keeps the beer cold as you walk around but the problem is the the frozen foam has a sort of like mangoey fruity weird taste to it it's a it's a weird taste i can't really describe and it just it leaks into the beer and doesn't uh, it's not good just get a draft beer and drink it so it's a blue moon slushy <laughs> yeah pretty much <laughs> okay no without the orange yeah. well if it's got like a mangoey citrusy foam on it yeah but, but still it, it's not it's but a, the foam isn't the texture's yeah, off the foam yeah. isn't no, traditional foam that. it's the foam is this like frozen concoction it's almost like an ice cream kind of like thickness to it, maybe a little thinner than ice cream. It not as like dense. a blue moon float. Yeah. <laughs> okay. You know what beer doesn't need anything that involves the right. word concoction. Yeah. It, it's not good. I'm not a fan <sighs> of it. There are people who love it. Well, if you drink your beer fast enough, it won't go yeah. cold. Do you know what? Warm. It won't get warm. You know what? It'll the guy who sick. invented the Yeti says his you can keep a beer cold for four hours, and I say if you if you take four hours to drink a beer, you're a pussy. A six pack doesn't even last four hours. Seriously, nope. I was just gonna say. I mean, <laughs> you, you don't need to keep a beer cold for four hours. Well, let's get real. It depends on on the size of the beer. Twelve ounce. <laughs> Twelve ounce. Eh, Forty. And if it's like a fourteen percent, like a milk yeah. stout or something, you're gonna nurse that. I think. Well, I don't yeah, think not you're for gonna... four hours though. I would well, say no, if, no, no. But I would say still, that, I think you'll still be done with it in like fifteen twenty. If minutes. you're being yeah. responsible. 30, 30 minutes tops. <laughs> 30 minutes tops. You know, here's the deal. I you wasn't saying use... we don't know what that word means, but I'm drinking fucking orange juice today. So <laughs> what, I can't talk. What I use my Yeti Colster for <laughs> is my backup beer. Mm. I got the one I'm drinking, and I got my backup beer in that one staying cold. There you go. So, And if you're bougie like me, you've got a couple backup beers in your juice. <laughs> but moving on. You know, you know what also does that? A cooler. Nice. Yes, but I don't. I don't yeah. have the cooler bucket in my recording studio like Tim does. <laughs> yeah, it's around here somewhere. <laughs> there it is. It's um, there. So yeah. Uh, also, you can get uh, you can get uh, soft drinks, bottled water, and green tea here as well. Um, well, the green tea is made fresh. It is. It's, it's actually pretty tea? good. It's matcha. I don't. Oh, like I like matcha tea. tea. So fucking sweet. It is. It is. And they usually add melon to it, so I shouldn't be drinking it anyway. <laughs> is powdered tea still technically considered fresh? It's freeze dried. Yeah. 
It's sort of like how freeze dried yeah, coffee. It's not like four seasons. But, but that's yeah, traditional yeah, for tea. Japan is the matcha tea. It's matcha tea. Yeah. Okay. All right, so let's go to the uh, another drinking establishment, the sake bar, which wasn't open. Oh, that's such a bummer! And I haven't seen it open the last few times. Before. Oh, the sake bar is really. The cool. It's not manned. It's sort of like an area now where you can buy sake mm-hmm. bottles, and that's really it. There was nobody sake behind cups the bar. And- yeah. Yeah, there was absolutely nobody behind the bar when we were there in the store. You can buy a sake set. It- well, you can buy a sake set yes. throughout the department store. They have that all over the place. But right? no, the sake bar, the like sake this, bar is great. I mean, they have a lot more variety if you go up there. If, if it's, it's open. open. I mean, there was nobody manning that. Area. I think. I, I think if I recall, they open around two or three o'clock in the afternoon. They're more open at night. I have no idea, but it just there was nobody manning it, so it was just kind of like a free for all. Mm. It's really cool, we but they have right they now. have a ton of uh, a ton of different sakis. I think I think they boast seventeen different sakis at uh, at that uh, that place, the bar. I want to say they had a pretty decent selection at the um at the um well at the garden house at the house as yeah. well. Yeah, they had a really decent selection at the garden yeah. house. It didn't necessarily be you didn't have to get the ones. Yeah, the, the garden floor. house has like six or seven different sakis. Which for a for what is more or less a festival style booth, it's a hot. that's pretty impressive. Plenty of places to go get drinks. Uh, I I definitely highly recommend the sake bar. It it when it when it opens, and I want to say if you go there in the evening time, it is open. Um, and they teach they they will definitely teach you about sake. And I talked about that back on episode one. They will gladly but educate you on sake. If you ask at the garden house, they of course will they will. Because we did have a whole course. Don't ask me a word of it because we were drunken before that. Yes. So. <laughs> it was after we had visited France. Yeah. Well, this was this was also the same day I had the Bloody Mary when I first walked into Epcot. So, mm, yeah, I don't remember anymore. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I just remember there were a lot of words. Yeah. And she was really sweet and really nice, but it was like, oh, this drunk American person. She was. She did look adorable when she was getting all. She brought the bottles out a second time so you could all look at them and she could show them. And I was like, oh, yes. I'll take her home with me. Oh, yeah, she was so James sweet, but it's like I couldn't remember I if, you, if you put a gun to did. my head. What? He James yes, there was a there was a live cast and when we did the song. Yeah. Yes, if you want to watch him do it, check it out. It's on the Facebook group. Just search for the videos. Uh, and you'll find all the live videos when people go live and and all the regerts. <laughs> <laughs> no regerts. <laughs> um, but look, after drinking all the all the sake, you definitely need to soak that up. So let's talk about some of the food options you can get there. There's a couple of snack uh, items, snack carts. Um, one of the uh, one of the more kind of like low key ones is the ice cream cart. Uh, you can get mochi ice cream in, in six different flavors. Green tea, strawberry, chocolate, mango, and vanilla. And mochi ice cream is basically ice cream encased uh, in a sticky rice dumpling uh, that kind of um, has the ice cream in the middle uh, that you get at your local uh, teppanyaki style place. Um, so yeah, mochi ice cream, it's it's delicious. Uh, green tea is my favorite. Uh, you can get the Hello Kitty, which is basically Hello Kitty looking ice cream. In uh, strawberry, it, basically, it's a strawberry vanilla flavor. Okay, so it's it's pink and white. Yep, pink and white. Okay. Uh, beverages: like diet, hey, hey, diet Coke, Powerade, uh, Ramyun, and Japanese and different Japanese drinks. So Japanese like sodas that you can get there. I think I'm going to the garden house. Uh, Ramyun is those like squeeze bottle uh, uh, juices, like a carbonated uh, juice drink. Like they come in like melon, strawberry, watermelon. Basically, soda water with uh, flavoring. It's like an Italian yeah, soda. Yeah, kind of like that. Oh, okay. Now, the other more famous snack cart is the uh, the Kakagori Stop, the uh, the Kabuki Cafe. It's a fun... Kakagori is fun to say. Kakagori is fun to say, but Kakagori is also delicious to eat. So it, this it is... is I've, I had it. It's good. This now now people will call this a snow cone. This is not a snow cone. This is shave ice, not shaved ice, but shave ice. Okay. Traditional no, no. Japanese shave ice. It's a um, snow cone. 
It's, it's not it's a snow, snow cone, cone, guys. It's the same stuff. Pretty sure. Uh, okay, it's a slush puppy. I mean, I don't know what the fucking no, term it's not you a want to go with. No, it's not a slush is. puppy. <laughs> oh, you're right. You're right. Because oh wait, you can get condensed milk on top of it, so it's a little. It is. Place. It is. You can get the sweet cream, but I mean, you're right. Few things are a slush puppy, but a slush puppy. And if you haven't had one, you've missed out. And this is not a. This is definitely not a slush puppy because it's a bigger. Like it's a. It's more ice than slushiness. Um. That's how. Have you never had a slush it's puppy? It's more of like a slushy. No. Oh, then then you're making it wrong, like Adam. <laughs> yeah. Well, but I mean, or it's a snow no, cone. It's... Have you ever had a yeah, snow I've cone? Yeah, snow cones. Where it, they, you just, it's pretty much just chipped yeah, ice. Yeah, shave ice is... And then you... Yeah, no. If the same slush puppy concept. is basically a slurry of yeah. sleet and syrup, if you're doing it right, because they let you control how many pumps you're putting in. They say you only put two pumps in there, but if you're not putting five <laughs> in, you, you were never 12 years old. And you've all been 12 years no, old. No, I used to choose all the damn flavors. And that's fine. That's fine. That's, that's still more colored. than two. It used to be, by the time I was done, it was like this brown-black <laughs> yeah, color that nobody yeah. should eat. <laughs> it turned purple. <laughs> it was a suicide. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Exactly what was a hot fucking mess. <laughs> but yeah, category is shave ice topped with fruit syrups. You can have your choice of strawberry, melon, cherry, tangerine, blue raspberry, or blue raspberry or rainbow. Gotta go rainbow. Rainbow's good. Rainbow's Everybody's good. Everybody's a toddler. I, I like the cherry one. That's one of my favorite. But rainbow is good. And then uh, obviously, uh, in traditional Japan, you would top it with sweet milk, which is kind of condensed milk that's uh, been sweetened. Uh, highly recommend it. This gets you that traditional Japanese experience. It's ridiculously good. Now, they also have some adult snacks here. You can get the sake mist, which is alcoholic shaved ice, with blood orange, blackberry, coconut, and pineapple. So, basically sake, shave ice, and then your flavoring. And a blood orange sake or a pineapple sake mist, I'd be, I'd be down for that. The line for this is so insanely long. It can be long. Most of the time. It's like trying to get a Dole Whip in Adventureland. Yeah. Uh, They also have some snacks there. You can get edamame, which is chilled uh, soybeans. You, uh, in the pods, you bite them, eat them. They're delicious. We have an edamame festival in Arkansas. Do you really? What the hell is that about? Yes, we do. It was literally this past weekend. Wow. I'll take things I didn't know for (laughs) 5,000. Right. And until you just <laughs> things I, didn't I know wouldn't what the expect, it was until you just explained it to me. <laughs> uh, but there's also sushi. Uh, you can get a California roll, Tamari sushi roll, which is basically um, California roll topped with uh, tuna. Uh, Futomaki big roll, which is two pieces of California roll topped with crab and vegetables. Uh, beer is also here. Kirin, Asahi, Sapporo, wine. You can get Nagori sake, plum wine, and then regular hot or cold sake. Um, so now we get to the actual sit down restaurants. The first one is, is a quick service. Uh, and this is the, um, the Katsura grill. Now up in the top, if you're looking at the front of the pavilion, the top left corner has a a kind of a, a quick service restaurant there. It's a a traditional tea house. Now, normally the tea house would serve tea, but this serves a kind of like, all right, let's call this what it is. It is pseudo Japanese food. <clears throat> it's California rolls, teriyaki chicken, teriyaki shrimp, and beef, and uh, spicy tuna rolls. I'm like the only person who doesn't really like California. California rolls roll not good. It's just crab sticks and cucumbers wrapped in seaweed and rice. I prefer like one of my favorite is the tuna and avocado. The raw tuna with avocado mixed in there. Love that one. Uh, but one of my one of my favorite meals that I've ever got here was the udon. Udon is basically broth with noodles, uh, the big the big thick noodles, and then um, this one has either beef, which is like shaved beef, or uh, shrimp tempura, which you dip in there and and it's delicious. N- not to be confused with shaved. Not ice. to be confused with shaved ice, but like razor thin. It's like shaved beef. It's like thinly sliced beef. And then they put it in there, pour the broth on it, and it kind of cooks it all. It's a little like pho, but, you know, udon with... Totally different area right. of the world. Well, no, it's, it's very similar. <laughs> pho has shaved ribeye with um, put into there with broth it could, and rice noodles. Well, it could be any... It's any kind of 
beef yeah. almost from oh, yeah. I've beef, beef, beef balls and they have, I've had they have oh, tripe yeah. in it. There's there's a lot of different there's, things that go with There is a phenomenal phenomenal. You fucking phenomenal. Did you fucking do that, Scott? <laughs> I, of course he did. Have you met I Scott? I fucking went there. Forget Mom, about Mom. it. In, in <laughs> if I was in New York, I'd open up a restaurant. A restaurant called Forget About It. I I don't doubt it's already existing. <laughs> we, I, we we have Fuck King down here. <laughs> I was, was going to say there's probably a Fuck King. Oh, too. there's yeah. one in Arkansas. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, in Parsippany, we have a great Vietnamese restaurant. Restaurant, and they do amazing pho. Uh, but yeah, it, beef food on the. Sh I love the shrimp tempura. Dude. It's twelve dollars. It's a really filling meal for twelve bucks. I, I'm just always so far so afraid of getting tempura because it gets soggy and gross really it, quick. It can. If it's, if it's made right. Uh, here you can also get some ramen. Um, now they have the spicy seafood ramen, which is served with garlic shrimp, uh, fish cake, and then vegetables with ramen noodles and broth. Honestly, for a, a good quick service restaurant in Epcot, this is the place you go. If you're looking for a quick service place, this is one of my favorites. Now, has anyone been here? No. I can get better stuff here. I'm not saying it to be mean. It's just <sighs> truth. Yeah, but still, you got to eat somewhere, and this is a good place to eat. I, I really like it. So, th that's one of the better ones. And also, you can get your stuff, if it's a nice day, not too hot, sit on, on the patio right next to the koi pond, which is beautiful. And enjoy your, uh, your udon or your ramen. Can you feed the fish? No, you can't feed the fish. They tell you not to. Hmm. <laughs> Maybe they should train the fish not to eat. Now, there are two sit-down restaurants right now. There's about to be a third one. We talked about out in episode 108. Uh, New Park Who Dis? With all of the Epcot news. But the, the, the ones that currently exist, Tokyo Dining. Now, Tokyo Dining is more of like a metropolitan Tokyo style. Um, it's very clean lines, very modern inside. It has a wonderful view of World Showcase Lagoon and probably one of my favorite places to watch Illuminations while dining. Because you're up on you're up on the second floor, so you kind of like stand over the entire crowd and look out and have a great view. They pipe the music in, but here you can get uh, traditional sushi dishes, um, bento boxes. Uh, the I used to have one of those in my car. <laughs> the same stuff you can get over at the uh, the other place. You can get kind of like filet mignon um, kind of entrees where it's like uh, the tenderloin and then you get noodles, rice, and vegetables. Very similar to Teppan Edo, but it's rather than prepared at your, at your, uh, your table, it's just brought to your table. But it's it's good. I mean, have you guys ever had, a, had Tokyo Dining? We've only ever eaten at Tiffany. Oh, I've okay. only walked past Tokyo, which, if you listen to episode one, I think I said the same thing. You, you've actually never been inside the Japanese pavilion, Mikey. No. No, I haven't. Couldn't find it. <laughs> walked around the showcase twice. Couldn't find it. <laughs> uh, it's, you know, it's a good place. They have, uh, they have beer. They have uh, sake. Um, they have plum wine. It, it, it's a wonderful restaurant, and like I said, if you get a late reservation, and it's right around uh, Illuminations or Epcot Forever or Epcot United or Epcot Soon to Be, you can you can watch the the fireworks show. Now the last uh, the last restaurant, uh, Tim and Adam, you guys have been to Teppanado, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It is uh, traditional teppanyaki style. Uh, it serves, what, what is it, eight people per uh, table? Yeah, I think it's more than, I want to say it's either ten, 10 or 12. I think there was 10. There was a lot. It was definitely more than eight. Because I want to say there were five, there was like a family of five, Tim and I, and another couple at this one table. Yeah, it, it serves up to 10, but uh, they traditionally put eight at a table, but they can accommodate up to 10. Now it's uh, it's this the same teppanyaki style dining that you see all across the country that started in San Francisco. Oh wait, no. is it San Francisco or New York? Yes. With um, Benny Hanna. Sure. But, yeah, no, it was New York. Benny Hanna, I thought it was. Yeah, Jersey. it was New York. Ben Benny Hanna's in New York. 
they were the first to come over and bring this this kind of like um, presentation at your table. So there's a griddle cooktop. They cook all your food right there. It's uh, uh, fried rice, uh, noodles, uh, and then you kind of pick your meat. You you pick your you know filet mignon, sirloin steak, uh, scallops, shrimp, chicken. Um, here is it, it's it's good. Now you guys have been there. What was the food quality like compared to a normal teppanyaki style that you have every day at home? Basic. I mean, I find that the believe it or not, the one here is better. Me personally, but I mean, it, it's you're not going for the quality of food. You're going right. for the shit. And they make a Mickey out of onions. Maybe. Yeah, they still, they still and they do the typical boy, volcano, and they do the sake shots. I mean, it, it's it's they throw they, they throw standard. the shrimp at you. Oh, we get egg. No, they usually throw oh, vegetables, vegetables out. Okay. They're getting cheap with the shrimp. Yeah, that's true. They are. Well, see, we get egg thrown at us. He fries up one egg just so he can throw it at people. Whoa! He'll fry it up and cut it up, that... and he'll he'll pitch egg to you. Oh, see, I've always done vegetables or shrimp. It's usually like zucchini yeah. or. Um, a I mean, squash. I would be down for shrimp, but you know. Yeah, I've never had a shrimp. Throw I've never me. missed an egg so far. Knock on wood. <laughs> now you can it... the huevos. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now you can you can get anything here from your traditional uh, grilled shrimp, Scottish fillet salmon, um, Julian beef, New York strip steak, filet mignon. Uh, and then they have like the combination steak and shrimp, steak and chicken, chicken and shrimp, um, scallops. But here you can actually get side dishes. Now, this is the cool part. So you can get a side dish of lobster tail. It, that will run you $28 for a four to six ounce northeastern cold water tail. Uh, you can get a side ounce of tuna tataki, which is a really, really, really sushi grade ahi tuna loin which is topped with scallions and then they put tempura crunch on it and you eat it raw that that'll run you sixteen dollars uh you can get an extra five pieces of shrimp for 15 bucks uh you can get uh cold water sea scallops for 18 dollars and then you can get brown rice for two dollars but the big add-on here is the a5 wagyu sukiyaki style sliced Wagyu steak. And that will run you $56 for three ounces. Not worth it. Yeah. I, nope. I, 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 I can't... I can't fathom when you can go to your local... I mean, if, if, you're, if you're bougie enough, you can go to your local butcher and get a full Wagyu ribeye or order it online and from like Snake River and get Wagyu ribeye for $56 per steak. Where you can get, you know, 12 ounces of that as opposed to three ounces. And and it's still cooked on the fucking grill, so you don't know what the fuck yeah. you're getting. I mean, I'm not saying it to be an ass, but it's just, it's, I don't think I it's mean, worth we, it. At least we, not we talked We talked about the new restaurant that's opening and it's going to be more of that like, the, the 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 style that's crazing Japan right now is the cook your own meat well, on that we, infrared grill thing. We don't know what I know, it's, it's be so yet. weird. It really is. I can't picture them doing an infrared grill with children around. I don't think it's going to be a children friendly restaurant. It's going to be like Monster Paul. I mean, yes, but you still have children who go to Monster Paul. You still have all the signature restaurants have to be able to. Yes, have a child no one is, in that restaurant. Victoria Albert's is the second children. somebody burns their hand on an infrared grill that's done uh, I, I still think they'll do it I think it's going to be that style I don't think so I don't think so it's a reason why you don't have a place like that just does fondue oh those are so good at Disney I do love fondue yeah where, where do you see that at Disney they had to get rid of the hot cheese the melted cheese for all for when right? you think about it come on now there's no way they're going to be able to do mm. that at Disney Look, uh, you guys have been there. You like it. You uh, Do you plan on going back? No, it was a no. one and done. It's a yeah, one and done. done for us. We, have, we have yet to do it. It always kind of makes our short list. Because I love teppanyaki. 
But again, I can go on a Saturday night here at home and do teppanyaki and have a good time and, and it's not going to cost me $200. You've got hibachi right down the block. Yeah, I do. We have two hibachi restaurants by us. I mean, it's just three actually when you think about it. One's ridiculously overpriced. But it just, it, it's not something I need to go to Disney for and there's other restaurants I would choose over it. I will say my favorite, uh, my favorite thing about hibachi or teppanyaki, the udon noodles. Mine too. I love the udon noodles. I love, I love noodles, the udon noodles. But but you can get noodles at freaking, um, what is it called? The buffet. Not the buffet family style. Oh, uh, Ohana? Ohana. Yeah. Oh, yeah. those are good. Just... Yeah, but it's yeah, udon noodles. It's nothing crazy. I buy them at the local grocery store yeah. to make the pali udon noodles. Uh, but you know, it's it's not a bad restaurant. Now we, like I said, we do we do have the the new restaurant opening up. We talked a little bit about. See, I disagree. It's uh, it's totally overpriced for what it is. It's not the worst food. It's ve- it is overpriced. It's not the worst food, but is no, very it is expensive very expensive. I mean, is. to put it put it mildly, the. Um, Let's see. The uh, New York cut steak is $34. Now, you go to your local teppanyaki place, that's going to be $20, $22. Two, $22. Yeah, $22.50. $22. Something stupid mm-hmm. like that. It, it, and you're still getting all the accoutrement with it. And if you add shrimp to the steak, then you might get close to that $30. I, honestly, but, I think if, if you spend $34 at your local hibachi place, you're going to get... You're probably going to get like six ounces food. of filet mignon plus 15 shrimp or 10 shrimp. And you had a sushi app. And a sushi appetizer. Yeah. I mean, you're going to get a lot more value back at home. It is It is definitely an overpriced restaurant. Just not worth it for me. I don't need to do it again. We were able to get a same day reservation. Yep. Oh, were you? We're literally within an yes. hour's notice. I think with, with Disney, the... The more they keep upping their prices, the more people kind of stay away from these sit-down restaurants. This was year, about two or three years ago. This wasn't recently. Oh, was it? Yeah. Okay. It's 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 an easy reservation to get. I, I mean, you, you look at some res- reservations that used to be really hard to get. Teppanado was one of them for a while. Now it's regularly available. Um, Like, the reservations that you used to be able to easily... And this is a totally different so show topic, but the hard reservations, the restaurants have gone down hill. So, mm-hmm. Le Cellier. Exactly. Yeah. Your your five star, four star restaurants are no longer five or four star. So yeah, I mean even Tiffins, like Tiffins, is a same day reservation now. Tiffins has always been a same day reservation. It's so weird because like it's supposed to be that like, like it's ultimate location. Yeah, it's location. not just the location. That restaurant is humongous. It's big. It is a when you really think about, they have four for a signature style restaurant. That place is humongous. I would say what it seats what three hundred more than three hundred people. I wouldn't surprise me if it seats more than that. There's like what three or four dining rooms. There's three rooms. Three rooms, probably. Well, eighty-five to a hundred people per room. Yeah, at least. Because those rooms are pretty big. It's not like Montreal Paul where you can fit like fifty people, a hundred people at most. This is, and I think that's what they're going to start doing. Is I think, well, I think they should start doing is having the signature dining limited to 100, 110 tables max, or either that, 110 or give people me, max. Give me a Victoria and Albert's experience at Tiffins with the different it's rooms. The, yeah, the Joe Rody experience. No, I don't want a Joe Rody. I want food. <laughs> feed me see. yeah well, it feed has me. nothing to do with who's talking to me during a, a meet and greet or what have you or paying that extra for it I want food you give me high quality food I'm all in yeah um, with the bar and the outside seating it's 252 people it's a lot for a signature wow that's a lot for a signature that's a lot I mean that's a, that's a that's a one dining credit size restaurant even some but of the you, one dining credits are small. Look at Tony's. Tony's is tiny compared to that. Probably. I mean, Tony's probably like 180. Probably less than that. It's not that big. Wow. What does Beer guess? Beer guess is huge. Beer Rex is humongous. Beer guess is huge. Yeah. That's, ca- that's got to be close to like 400. Um, but look, you know, getting back to Japan, 
Um, a lot of good food here. I mean, you guys have been there during the festivals. They have some uh, interesting offerings, whether it's the uh, at food and wine. I think they had the volcano roll, which was ridiculously spicy. But I like my sushi that way. I love it. So I but love I it. won't. Again, this is something I can get at home. And that's kind of my biggest disappointment with a lot of their booth offerings is that it's basic. It's it super is. basic. There's nothing exotic or or interesting that I can't get anyplace else. So look, after you've after you've stuffed yourself at one of the <clears throat> one of the three restaurants or a couple of snack carts, you gotta do some shopping because there's no I mean, you don't go to Disney and don't come up come back with souvenirs. I mean nobody does that. And one of the biggest biggest gift shops on property <sighs> is in the J- Japanese pavilion. Would I call it a gift shop, though? Absolutely not. No, it's like a mall. It's a store. I mean, it's, it, it's Mitsukashi, and I'm sure I'm killing the pronunciation, but basically it's a store chain based out of Japan. Nope, you got it. Oh, look at Mitsukashi. Me. And it's headquarters based in Tokyo, and it's one of the oldest, like, mall stores in Japan. And you can get mm-hmm. anything here from... Com- actual traditional kimonos to like the Japanese cutesy stuff to randomized Japanese snacks that you can't necessarily get here like green tea flavored Kit Kats and I don't know if I'm going to be trying all that but I mean it- it's a fun store to walk around do I necessarily buy anything here ever? No. <laughs> but it's a really cool place to have a sword fight with people. Now there there are two <laughs> That's true, because they actually have samurai swords. Yes. <laughs> now, there are two stores, two Mitsukoshi stores in North America. No, there are not. There's only one. Oh, oh, it closed? New York has been closed for a very long time. There was a pop-up oh. store back in, I want to say, 2014 or 2016, and that was only for Fashion Week. But the New York store has been gone for a very long time. There's This is the only one... That's still there and operated by the Mitsukoshi. Mitsu, Mit, now I can't say it. Mit, Mitsukoshi. Mit, Mitsukoshi group. But it, it's mostly Japanese pop culture. You can find like video game toys and like Nintendo stuff. You used to be able to. Pokemon was when Pokemon was hitting its heyday. You would be able to find all the Pokemon stuff, and I'm sure you're going to find it again with the new movie coming out. But. It's really expensive for what it is. You're better off going to Canal Street in New York and finding (laughs) something cheaper. I'm I'm just... Shit, Amazon. Yeah, (laughs) Amazon.com is your friend. But it's just... Yeah, if you want to try some of the more crazy candy flavors or get an official sake set, you can still find that cheaper at, like, Pier 1. I mean... (laughs) This was fifteen dollars on Amazon. Yeah, it would exactly. be like forty-five dollars at Disney. Yes, because now it's hand painted exactly. by the smallest. Hey, come on now, I'm not stupid. Cherry blossoms, forty-five dollars. Mm, it, it hand painted cherry blossom just for you. <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm sorry. It's just, mm-hmm. it's cool. Now they do, they do have some cool traditional souvenirs. Like you can, you can actually buy bonsai trees here, and ship them home. I mean, you can go to your local um, gardener and get a bonsai tree, too. I mean, there's there's nothing. It's a department store. The only thing that I can see myself, if I had a little girl or, like, just a girl that I was going with, I would like to see them trying a real kimono. Like a true kimono. That's kind of cool because that's something that, that's an experience you can't get anyplace else. But a lot of it is just toys and tchotchkes that I don't necessarily need or want. Now, I mean, you can you can actually buy the full um, samurai kit, like the uh, the obi and the the kimono. You can buy the traditional dress here. It's really cool. I would never spend the money on it. I mean, it's going to run you like three hundred, four hundred dollars. If this is what I'm going to do, I'm going to go to Japan. Yes. This is not necessarily. There's no Disney labeled stuff here. Mm -mm. So this is not the place you want to get your Walt Disney World souvenir from. No. This is actually run by the Mitsukashi Group, which is a department store at the end of the day. I did have a pair of chopsticks that I bought here in 04. And I kept those for probably close to like 12 or 14 years. And then you bought your next pair on Amazon. Yeah, and it was a lot cheaper. <laughs> exactly my point. 
<laughs> actually bought a set of like six for the same price. <laughs> exactly. It just it it doesn't. Is it fun to walk around? And yes. Is it yeah. fun to see all the creepy favors of the food? Yes. Mm -hmm. Do you nearly need to buy a five dollar pack of three gummy bears? No. Prawn flavored gummy bears? Yeah, exactly. No, I don't need a prawn flavored gummy bear. I don't need a fish stock flavored gum. No, no, thank you. Pass. Hard pass. It, it is cool, though. It is cool to kind of walk around. It's fun to walk around. It's always crowded, though. And it, there's always. It, 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 it's, it's a mall. Yeah. It's a mall store. Now, uh, now, Japanese the, the Japanese pavilion is is home to uh, a couple of booths that pop up here and there be between the, the two festivals that uh, that that show up. The three festivals now, with the the Festival of the Arts, Flower and Garden, and, and Festivus Food for the rest of us. And yes, <laughs> if you Beats visit in stuff. if you visit Japanese pavilion in June and July, you've missed out on these two these booths. So. Uh, but Tim is going to tell us about some of those booths and the offerings they have. So, yeah, Epcot is now one giant festival, except for, like, two months out of the year, like Scott said. The first festival starts in the beginning of the year, and that's the Festival of the Arts. So during that festival, you have Takumi Table. And the food offerings for that one is Tayaki fish-shaped Japanese sweet stuffed pastry with red bean paste and topped with whipped cream and sesame custard. Or a sushi donut. What? Which is a yeah donut-shaped sushi featuring salmon, tuna, shrimp, avocado, and masago extended with citrus, soy, jelly, and wasabi. I really want you to try this. I I'll really want to try this. Oh, I thought Adam was freaking out and saying no. No, it looks it. awesome. No. It I'll looks take that. So that good. sounds really good. Basically a ring of fish and rice. Yes, I'll have that. I'll have three. And for drinks, you just have Sapporo Draft, uh, Masusaki in a traditional personalized wooden cup, or a melting snow cocktail, which is sake, peach schnapps, cranberry juice, and Japanese kalpiko. Now, if they when they serve this, uh, okay, so sake is traditionally served in a wooden box. It's literally a wooden box. You drink it out of it. The the tradition is they're supposed to overflow it because it's like the overflowing your cup with good luck. So I hope they do that. But I, doubt I, I doubt it. I doubt it highly. They probably fill it just to the top. Yep. <laughs> probably. So now next uh, festival is Flower and Garden, which is going on right now. And the booth becomes Hanami. So for food, you have the Fushi which we were talking about earlier, is fresh pineapple, strawberry, and melon rolled with coconut rice, sprinkled with toasted coconut, whipped cream, and raspberry sauce on the side. You have a chilled soba noodle salad with pan-seared tuna and wasabi dressing. Chicken karaj with nanban sauce, a Japanese-style fried chicken served on a bed of shredded cabbage and topped with soy and vinegar-based dressing. And for drinks, it's just Kirin draft beer, Sayuri, which is Little Lily Niguri Saki. Ichigo Sun, which is Strawberry Lemonade Cocktail with Saki, Strawberry Puree, and Lemonade. I would definitely do this, uh, the chilled soba noodle salad. That sounds really good. With some, like, you know, seared raw tuna on it. Yeah, I'd, I'd do that. Check that out in, a, in about a month. Is this still be going on with you? Yep. Goes till June sixth now. Oh, that's right. And you're you're going in the middle mm -hmm. of May. Now for food and wine, it just named Japan. The booth is just <laughs> named Japan. It loses a like an actual real name. Clever, <laughs> real clever. Well, most of the food and wine pavilions are actually named like it. Yeah, yeah. If if specifically what you're eating is themed to that country, otherwise they got them really weird ones like I don't know about citrus blossom. Yeah. Yes. Flavors of fire. Yeah, flavors of fire is awesome. It, it was, yeah, it really is. I like that fun yeah, food dish they flavors. had. <laughs> so for food and wine, you get a teriyaki chicken bun, which is a steamed bun filled with chicken, vegetables, and a sweet teriyaki sauce. Beef nigiri topped with shrimp sauce and diced pickled jalapenos, or a spicy roll, which is tuna and salmon topped with volcano sauce. 
For beverages, you have Kirin Ichiban Lager, Ozeki Rai Saki, or the Fuji Apple Cocktail, which is Saki, Peach Knops, and Green Apple Syrup. Which is the same Fuji Apple Cocktail mm-hmm. they have over at the Green, uh, the Garden House. You are correct. Yes. Uh, they used to have the beef and soba, soba noodles. So, so look, we tried a couple of these in our last trip. The spicy roll, that was spicy as fuck. Mm. Like we get, I mean, we get spicy amazing. sushi at home. This was ridiculously hot, like really hot. I did, I didn't, I expected it to be like a spicy roll that you get, you know, spicy tuna roll that you get at your local sushi place. But this was really, really hot. It was good though. I liked it. Uh, and then the teriyaki chicken bun was delicious. The beef nigiri, I was not, not going near. This is basically kind of almost raw beef. It's like slightly cooked, served over a bed of rice, topped with um, a, a like cream sauce, and then diced pickled jalapenos. It looked weird, and I was not about to try that. I'm very adventurous with my food, but not 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 this. Not at a festival. Thing. Yeah, yeah. If this was at my local sushi place, and they serve like. Kobe style beef raw, I would eat that. I've had, I have eaten that. This beef nigiri on a, a bed of rice, no, no, thanks. Pass, heart pass. Now, what, have you guys tried any of these? Mm-mm. There's nothing here that's out of the ordinary. Eaten. Last time I ate the Japan, the Japan Pavilion, they had a udon uh, beef teriyaki, which was good. Yeah, beef udon's good. I like it. That was it. I would just tend mostly to just do the drinks. Yeah, the, the drinks are good. I mean, but the, but the the truth is, with the Japanese pavilion, it's much like the Italy pavilion. The better stuff is back on the inside in the tables in the the restaurants. Oh yeah, you don't get any of the food from the. No, the no. Pavilions. Tutto Italia, Tutto Gusto, and Via Napoli are far better than anything that booth is going to put and, out. Uh, what was the the new one that the by the pizza by the slice? Oh yeah. I forgot what that one was called, but it literally translates to by the yeah. slice or something like that. Yeah, definitely. I mean, any of these, like this pavilion, the the food booth is just okay. Like the the chicken bun was, it was a lot of bun. It was a lot of dough and very little actual like meat to it. I think I'm spoiled because where I grew up in New York, you can get really good food. Like yeah, it's just this 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 booth never has done it for me. The Chinese I have the same problem with the China booth though. So yeah, we haven't been to Nine Dragons in forever because uh, well yeah, just, uh, no. look where we live. <laughs> no no no. <laughs> um, but yeah, look, the festivals go on every year. Uh, I'm excited to see what they're gonna bring for food and wine. Maybe I will try. I think with um. I, I don't know. Maybe I'll try the sushi donut. I would try it if it's there, but that's only that's not that's only festival arts. Only in festival of arts. I, I might try that. I would try that. Uh, no, I, I wouldn't get the bun again. It was all dough. The the spicy roll. It was okay. It was a spicy tuna roll, but it was really really hot. Like even my wife, who loves spicy food, tried it. And she's like, "Wow, this is really hot." And I am. I will eat the hottest of hot wings, and this was hot. So see, but I don't like hot wings, but I like spicy tuna. So it was all right. Um, so look, there, there's plenty to offer at Japan. Um, I, I still think it is one of the most photogenic uh, and relaxing pavilions to walk through. I love walking through that area. Uh, a couple years ago, I took Ethan. Uh, on a dad's day, we, it was basically me and me and Ethan all alone. I sent Andrew to the spa. I got a kakagori, and we walked through the back of the pavilion and just sat in the. They sell pills for that now, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but if you have a kakagori for more than three hours, you see a physician. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> Especially if it's got that white shit on top of it, the kind of creamy. <laughs> I I enjoyed just kind of like walking through the pavilion. It was a lot of fun. It, it, yeah, we do as it's well. It's beautiful. It really is. Really is beautiful. Mikey, check it out sometime. 
I should. I should. Maybe maybe I get a chance to this next time Just I'm don't, done. Don't Disney. bring your fishing rods to the Quaker. Yeah. <laughs> no. well, hey, hey, true story. Maybe I could get away with it if I brought my... Uh, Bamboo one? Yes. Yes. My little... Um, I can't think of the word. Why, why you got to do this to me and I can't think of the word to make you've it said all it, make sense? You've said it on the air. I know you have because you've talked about it. Yeah, it's sitting. It's, it's right there. It's, I could grab it right now. It's a Japanese uh, fishing pole. Oh, yeah. You know, I, I probably could if I had my little bitty bamboo tenkara fishing pole that they there use it in is. Japan for, for fly fishing. Um, you know, I, I could zip one out there real quick and I'd land it and throw her back because I don't, I'm don't. i not going to keep a koi. Look, Mikey, I'll tell you what. If you can't throw, eat koi. Yeah, you can't eat koi. Oh, um, you can flay them out. Or you can put them in a bathtub and... Back in your room. I will say, Mikey. Okay, I didn't know where you were going with that, Tim. <laughs> yeah, no, I was kind of I lost scared. my train of thought for a second. <laughs> Mikey, if you... You know when you go to those, like, trout farms to go yep. catch fish? Yep. And you throw, like, a little handful full of food and it's like piranha? <laughs> oh, yeah. I bet you that's like this. <clears throat> well, that's not as much. Oh, we did fun. that behind the scenes with the... Um, Tilapia. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Let you feed the tilapia, and you throw that in there, and it just—it's like piranha. The whole tank just becomes yeah. No, oh, yeah. <laughs> they, my first time catching trout was at a trout farm at Dog Patch USA, one of Arkansas's first theme parks. Mm. And yeah, that's how it was. You didn't yeah. even have to do anything. You just dude put a piece of corn on a hook, and his hands were bloody because kids kept hooking him. And you throw it out there, and just immediately start reeling in, and you'd have a trout on the end of it. And I was like, ha, huh, this isn't fishing. <laughs> this sucked. <laughs> Where do you keep the big ones? Yeah, he I told me out back and offered to show me, so I don't know what that meant. Ooh, kinky. Oh my! I mean, I, I I remember like going to the trout farms in California, and basically it's like big giant pool, and you cast your line, and within like I want to say a good three and a half seconds, there's a there's a fish on there. Yep. All right, Mikey, as we finish up the Japanese pavilion, um, you definitely had the most interesting uh, armchair imagineer back on episode one. So uh, I'm going to let you wrap this up tonight. I mean, I appreciate that vote of uh, confidence based on my uh, freshman effort <laughs> in, in, in podcasting. Your, um, well, your desire to, to, to go all uh, Sarah Jessica Parker? Oh, hey, this Why this, this was face? basically <laughs> it was it was uh, along the lines of you know the little Jedi thing at Hollywood Studios, but with fire. Yeah, you remember something about you wanted to set. I just remember fire. there was fire involved. I didn't want to. I I wouldn't. I wouldn't put them in polyester uh, robes. It would definitely have to be something. Flame retardant, not, not flame flammable. retardant. Yeah. Yes, yes. Um, but uh, I was really proud because I did a lot of research on that, and then you know, it it apparently was overshadowed by someone wanting to uh, make a train, a bullet train. But Epcot. we didn't have poles at the time, so I didn't, I didn't win anything. No, no, you did. That's fine. We we had we we had twelve members in a Facebook group. That's so, true. Hey, That's don't true. nobody give two shits about the episode one, really. Three people like mine. I won. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they were all hosts. What the hell? <laughs> yeah. Hosts and, and host Yeah, houses. pretty much. Yeah, yeah. As someone who hasn't spent near enough time in the Epcot Pavilion, this is definitely something uh, which I think is, is most of Epcot for a guy like me because I I, I normally go with my kids and and we're just we're just walking through Epcot to get to an ADR, and that's a shame. Epcot World Showcase in particular. You need to slow down. You need to enjoy it. And we, I got a chance to do that last year when it was just me and the wife. Um, got to spend a little more time in the Norway Pavilion because Broken Ever After was broken. And, uh, you know, got to take a little time in, in, in Italy. And uh, I don't think we made it to France because Germany. But, uh, yeah, I, I enjoy... Um, these DHDs in Epcot and Japan is definitely one that I should have spent more time in because going back to episode one I had the same thing as like I've never been into the department store I've never stopped long enough to listen to the drummers um, you know I've never even 
gotten anything to eat or drink there. So uh, I, I really enjoyed this uh, this sit down and, and, and chance to go through it because uh, I miss out on a lot of stuff since I've only uh, been to Disney but just a handful of times. So Normally, Ultimate Epcot is where we kind of like go through the pavilion and then take a vote on what the best iteration of the pavilion was. This really hasn't changed too much from 1982. Like, apart from some offerings at the restaurant... It's really and and, so, and some you know minor entertainment. It's really not changed too much. No, you've had a yeah. few uh, some rotational things in the gallery. Yeah, that's probably the only thing that changes at any type of regularity. Well, that in the, in the meet and greets have changed, but other than that, I can't think of anything. I yeah, other than um, having like an act in here or there, it, it's really the same. Like this this pavilion's kind of untouched since 1982, which makes episode one all the more reason to to do something to this other than add a, a, a five diamond restaurant whatever they're going to do to it <laughs> i don't I, think I, it's even going to be five diamond to be honest i, I still think it's a mistake i, I think this is a big mistake so do, I. I mean, do we need do we need three restaurants in japan no no, no. three sit downs and a quick service I think I think one of the sit downs at least one of the sit downs is going to well, go i mean it again like i said before it's just what's the point of having another high-end steakhouse. When your steakhouses say, are struggling right now with reservations yeah. and they're not good. I would say if with another restaurant coming into Japan in the future, probably literally today <laughs> may be the best iteration before that restaurant hits <laughs> yeah. and opens up. Just just be, I mean it's there's there's not enough uh there's not enough need for it, and it, the space could have been used for something um, better to represent the uh, the nation of Japan. Even if it wasn't entertainment related or attraction related, you could have done something better, Disney, than give us more forks, yeah, more chopsticks, as it were. Yeah, I mean this needs this needs an attraction. This really does, and they've got the room for it. And I'm surprised they not haven't done anymore. It yet. <laughs> yeah. No, this, they're throwing there's another for... restaurant in there. Where no, that's that's only going on the very like front side of it. There's nothing there right now. It's they back. have the room behind. It's further this. back. No, no, it's it's literally on the bottom floor of the Mitsukoshi Department Store. It's on the left side or the right that's side. That's not of what they had blocked off. So maybe something is going back there, but there was a whole section of it with like there's Nothing's something take... going on in there. Nothing's going where the paint can storage is. There's plenty of room for an attraction, and I'm just surprised they haven't done it yet. With what? With what IP? Big Hero. Can't do it. Doesn't make you could, sense. You could do it, San Francisco. No, that's not in Tokyo or San Francisco. Yeah, if you put Big Hero in there, and then that whole mm -hmm. pavilion turns into Norway. Yep, turns into Arendelle. Yeah. Exactly. It's gonna happen. You really? No, you, you I don't can't. think so. I mean, maybe that's maybe they're gonna move the meet and greet down there from... I can see a meet and greet there. The meet and greet wouldn't bother me. You know what they need? They need a bullet train with a, a, I, a nice I thought, view. You no, know, you, know, you know what? I liked, I think it was... Was it Adam that had the puppets? Oh, no, yeah, the, I had the... Um, that was my no, story. Tim okay, had Adam had geishas? Geishas, yes. Whatever. Did I? I, I don't fucking remember. No, 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 Someone no, had no, the no. puppets. No, no I had the, the whole The other creation. guy had geishas. The other I guy had, had geishas. I had the creation he, story, I want to yes. say. Yeah, he who shall not be named had yes. geishas. <laughs> I had the okay. creation story. Yes. and I'd be down for puppets. Or ask me to remember stuff that happened two years I, ago. I think like Tim had... A, maybe Tim had Kabuki Theater. I haven't listened to the episode in I a while. I think Tim had the, the puppets and the Kabuki. I had the mm -hmm. puppets and the Kabuki. Yeah. That's... You could fit that in real easily. Yeah. Granted, it's not something that's going to eat, you know, thousands of people per hour like an attraction would. But I think only having the drummers... Drumming? Is... The drummers drumming. Twelve the four of them? Drummers, four. <laughs> no, there's only four drummers <laughs> drumming. Five uh, golden rings. That's going to work. Sorry. Adam's oh, counting up. That's the wrong way. You're supposed to count backwards. I make my own rules. <laughs> <laughs> I do what I want. <laughs> Don't tell me what to do. You know what? Someone told me to wrap this up and do the closing, and I'm like... <laughs> so, Mikey, tell us about Magical Meltdown. <laughs>
<laughs> there you go. <laughs> I can tell you this about Magical Meltdown. Uh, I got a confirmation today from UPS that the Nautilus uh, charity shirts are going to be delivered tomorrow. So I'll Ooh. start getting those separated out for everybody that ordered and get those shipped out this coming week to you. Nice. And nice. thank you for your patience. Thank you greatly for your patience. This uh, this 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 was a great a great fundraising effort, and I'm I'm going to be really happy to to get these all shipped out so folks can start wearing some Sheetles shirts in the park. And if you didn't get a chance to catch it, go to the Facebook page and look up uh, Manny M A N N Y like Handy. He went live during the actual printing of it. If you listen to it, the very end of it. Uh, the guy running the printing press asks, oh, who are these for? He says, a bunch of Disney drunks. Yeah, it's accurate. So, yeah, pretty accurate. much. You know, can't argue. You didn't lie. Can't argue with the truth. I want to thank you guys all for listening to us uh, each and every week. We enjoy bringing a little bit of Disney into your own lives. So uh, if you enjoy the show, go over to iTunes, rate, review, subscribe. That's the best way to help others like you find the show uh, by rating. We get bumped up on the search quality uh, by reviewing. We actually get more reviews, and so if you give us a good review, then more people will look at those and more people will see those and we'll be higher on the search volumes when uh, someone just searches Disney Podcast on iTunes. But also subscribe because that's the best way for you to get the show each and every week. If you don't want to miss the show, subscribe because it gets pushed right to your iPhone, it gets pushed right to your Android uh, your Samsung Galaxy that's caught fire by this time. Um, Mikey, episode one. La Poo La Poo Fire in the French. Yeah, that's right. The uh, topic has nothing... The title has nothing to do with the topic to because we're topic. talking about the Japan Pavilion. Mm-hmm. That's true. We are. We still don't know where the French came into that and uh, La Poo La Poo because reasons. How did... It was something that was said in the... Show. I, I used to have to really obscure titles for the shows. You know that what? I you know what? Look, them. I want some listener to go back, listen to episode one, and tell us how we got the French in that title. Is we should have fucking. Got <laughs> no, no, thank you. <laughs> pass. Hard pass. Just do that. that. Do that. If you, if you if you go if you go on to our Facebook group, facebook.com slash groups slash three sheets, you can tell us, and you know, tag us in the post. This is how you got the French into episode one. And you know you know what we're going to say? Oh, yeah. Or we're going to say, I don't remember any of that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we could say, well, I don't remember that shit. Because was it episode one, one B? No, no. Theme? One was no, one. Was no, one no, we kept that two to a reasonable was, length. No. Wasn't those the ones that we just blacked two out on? Two was the blackout was episode. It? I don't know. Yeah, 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 yeah. Two was bad. That was two years ago. So <laughs> that was the one we had to record. Yeah, again. two was bad. Uh, but look, if you want to follow us on Instagram and Twitter, we're over at Three Sheets Podcast. If you're in their parks, tag us on Instagram, tag us on Twitter. Uh, but don't forget to use the hashtag Three Sheets Nation. Uh, make it make it cool. Make thing. Do your do your stuff there. Uh, go over to the purple wall. Take a picture of you with your purple. There's a purple Dole Whip or some purple milkshake, something like that, that you can get. <laughs> And take it with your basic witch t-shirt that you got on Magical Meltdown. And uh, tag us like Carly's mom. Well, Carly tagged us. Wall. Carly tagged us, but Carly's mom was the one who was in front of the wall with her basic witch shirt. You can go to the dick wall with your Morocco mm-hmm. shirt. And make sure you get the tip in the photo. Yeah, don't. Yep, don't cut it off. Yeah. Don't don't be a moil. <laughs> Hi, him. The shame. <laughs> <laughs> but if you really want to interact <laughs> with us... Shame. <laughs> if you really really want to interact with us head over to our facebook group facebook.com slash group slash three sheets uh that's where all the fun happens and that's where you're going to go over there listen to episode one and tell us how we got the french into episode one because i don't remember for the life of me and i remember everything well you know what episode they were on word. well the french were on episode oh, one and 72 after that, I don't know. But they were part of episode one for some godforsaken reason. Maybe it was the Legend. I don't know. Someone <laughs> clarify that. Might have been. Might have been. Uh, but come hang out with us at the Facebook group. If you have friends that love Disney as much as you do, invite them. Join Three Sheets Nation. A lot of fun there. So, close your remarks tonight. Mikey. 
like I said before, I think uh, the Japan Pavilion um, looks fantastic. I, I've uh, always loved the photos of it and just haven't had a chance to walk around it myself. I've had chances, I've just never done it. So I guess it's uh, kind of like going for a run. Yeah. And I'm not saying I'm going to go for a run, but I'm saying I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stroll through the Japan Pavilion and maybe listen to the drummers and think, gosh, I wish I could purchase a uh, sculpted flamingo on a bamboo skewer from Miyuki. You can purchase an entire set of Japanese armor. What's that going to set me back? About tree fitty? Oh, God, four or five hundred. More than that. Oh, no, I don't need armor. <laughs> Wouldn't fit me anyway. <laughs> Too tall. You can get a samurai sword. <laughs> no, but you have to have no, you know that scene in uh, Big Hero when, when, when Hero is first putting on the first suit? Yep. The green oh, and black yeah. suit? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I am not fast. <laughs> <laughs> I love you, Mikey. I love you too, Scott. Somewhere. All right. So, ouch. <laughs> <laughs> Damn. All right, Adam. Give me some closer remarks. Done. <laughs> oh. <laughs> he just snapped his fingers on you. <laughs> well, you know what? Not quite. You just got bitch snapped. <laughs> well, half the listeners just turned your nose. <laughs> Adam, not. Maybe a little less than half of the hosts have disappeared. <laughs> Twice. <laughs> um, all kidding aside, I think we still have some open spots for the sheet up dinner with the 50 some odd thousand people who are coming to that. Over at Whispering Canyon? Yes, that's at Whispering Canyon. It's going to be this Saturday night. With the new night. menu we just talked about last week? Yes, correct. So... If you're all interested in that, please let me know. Either reach out to one of the hosts or post something on the um, group so that this way we know you're interested in coming to that dinner. I think we have like either four or five spots still open, but it's getting less and less every week. So Yeah. And look, dinner with, with Tim and Adam and Mikey is a lot of fun. Uh, you're not going to regret it. Um, not going to lie. Dinner with Stephanie no is a regrets. lot more fun. Dinner with Stephanie means somebody's getting a whole lot of corn bed because she's still yeah. that fiasco. <laughs> when you go to this dinner, Mikey loves cornbread. There's a grown woman riding hobby horses. Mm hmm. A lot of fun. Which is a fetish a I didn't know I had before. But. <laughs> Ask for the ketchup. So, Tim, give me some closing remarks tonight. Oh, I don't know. I mean, we saw Endgame tonight, so we'll probably when this episode drops, there will be a spoiler post that we can chat about it. Just don't put up anything yet because people we usually give them three or four days to watch it. Three or four days? Give me three or four years. Yeah, we're talking about Scott well, here. Just, he just finally saw just Iron fucked. Man. Just 3. don't click on that post then. Oh, I'm not going to. And I look, I will see this. I will see this in the next couple of weeks. I, I I anticipate seeing it. Well, we want to go see the uh we wanted to go check out the Dolby Theater in either Rockaway or Clifton, so let us know. We'll go out. We'll come out and see it. Right, Rockaway's not far, so we'll do that one. I enjoyed the Japanese Pavilion. It's one of my favorites. Uh, always has been. Always will be. I would love to see a bullet train a panoramic shot of you going through the various areas of Japan because that would be an awesome, awesome attraction. Episode one. So I will say from all of us here at Three Sheets of Mouse, thank you for making our show part of your Disney life. Thank you for your time this time and until next time. So long for just a while. Thank you! In a big blue pagoda. Oh God. How did I know you were going to go there? You can That's go scary. and explore. <laughs>